going to get underway here. And uh, to start us off this morning, I actually want to read from uh, Psalm 119. So we're in, in the Lenten season right now. And uh, so part of uh, my own uh, Lenten observance is to follow um, the readings in the uh, Anglican uh, Church of Canada's Book of Common Prayer. And so I figure, you know, these have been some pretty American events and I need some Canada uh, uh, just to set my mind at ease here. So I'm going to read uh, from Psalm 119 and then we'll do our, I'll pray and then we'll do our introductions. This is what Holy Scripture says. With my whole heart I cry, answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I arise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are awake before the watches of the night that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. They draw near who persecute me with evil purpose, but they are far from your law. But you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are true. Long have I known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Let's pray. O oh Lord, I pray that as we are gathered here together in your name, uh, that we would have the perspective of David here in Psalm 119. That you would help us, Lord, to love your word, to see in it as truth, and that your law, which endures forever, is something greatly to be desired. And as we are in this season of reflection and observance on ourself, Lord, I pray that a major part of our self-reflection would be done in light of your perfect commands, your perfect precepts. I pray that you would search us in our hearts and help us, Lord, to see our great need of you and instill within us by your Spirit a deep sense of longing, a longing, Lord, for Good Friday and a longing for Easter Sunday and the resurrection. Lord, we thank you for the events of last night and today. Uh, Lord, thank you that we have been reminded of the great need um, to be able to worship you freely something that your people have long known, even back to the days of the Exodus, Lord. And we think of Moses' call to Pharaoh, um, that he should let your people go so that you might be rightly worshipped. And so, Lord, as we think about these things again, I pray that you would help us to uh, really value the freedoms that we have in this country. And so, Lord, we pray for the United States of America. We pray for the countries of the Western world. Indeed, we pray for the world in total, that you would grant freedom for your people to worship you in spirit and in truth. So be with us this morning, Lord, as we uh, continue to think about deep subjects, Christian education in America or in Europe. Be with our speakers, be with all of us who are here, that we would receive what they have uh, with delight um, for the work that they have put into these things before your face. We pray also, O Lord, for the Davenant Institute and the work that they are doing, and we pray that you would steady their hand at the plow. For Christ's sake, amen. Well, for those of you who were not here last night, thank you for coming out. Uh, we're smaller in number, but that is okay, because um, I think that uh, the, the value of what is being spoken here for each one of us is of tremendous importance. Um, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things um, before I introduce Dr. Anderson to us. Um, just um, a little bit of order of service, if you want to put it this way. So we're just going to um, have uh, two talks uh, this morning. We'll have Dr. Anderson um, address us uh, first off, and then we'll have Dr. Copeland. 
Um, and uh, Professor Plato will introduce him uh, in an hour or so, and then we're going to have a, a panel discussion talking about the various issues that have been brought up either last night or today. Uh, and then there'll be uh, lunch provided. So if you stick around, um, then you'll be free to avail yourselves of, of a lunch. Again, I just want to offer some thank yous. Um, thanks to um, our uh, School of Theology Dean, Dr. Cotter, for uh, the support that he has given to all of the Davenant Institute events we've done here on campus. Also, thanks to President Sweeting and for his great support uh, as well of, of Davenant. And uh, I want to thank uh, just people behind the scenes that have helped get things done, like Sodexo for providing food for us in the back and at lunch, uh, for Walter as well, and uh, setting up all of the audio and the visual. Uh, also, thanks to the Davenant Steering Committee, uh, so Professor Plato and Samantha and Caleb Coho. And uh, thanks as well to the School of Theology Administrator, Carolyn Tenbarge, who also helped uh, greatly to get this uh, going. Um, again, Davenant Institute has a book table at the back, so if you're interested in purchasing any books uh, relevant to uh, these issues of political philosophy, um, avail yourselves of those. There's a conference discount. A couple I'd recommend, I meant to bring up with me, but I didn't. Uh, one is an interesting one. If you're thinking through questions of pacifism, um, there's a book there called Jesus and Pacifism, written by a Canadian, that's why I highlight it, and he's a friend of mine, Andrew Fulford, uh, who's involved with Davenant, and a uh, very interesting take uh, looking historically at the question of pacifism from a Christian perspective. And um, there are, you know, um, uh, Ad Fontes, which is our, our uh, magazine, they're there for free as well. And if you want more information about the Davenant Institute, you can sign up on the sign-up sheet there in the back. Um, so today, um, again, we're happy to have Dr. Anderson, Owen Anderson, here with us to address us on the question of um, what it's like uh, to teach as a Christian in a secular university. And so today's talk is going to be different than last night's in some regards, uh, particularly it'll be more autobiographical, and he's going to be talking about just his own personal experiences, having uh, gone to Arizona State University for all of his degrees up to his Ph.D., uh, he now teaches there, and so um, he can, th you know, think about both it, uh, this issue from the, the student side as well as from the professor side. Uh, and uh, for a short time in 2013-2014, uh, he had a, uh, a stint as William E. Simon uh, Research Fellow in the James Madison program at Princeton University. So if you're familiar with that, that's a very prestigious program uh, where uh, Robert P. George is involved in running it. Uh, and so uh, maybe he can give us some Princetonian reflections, too. I'm not sure. Um, Dr. Anderson has published a number of books, seven of them. Uh, the one I'm particularly interested in is called Reason and Worldview, where he looks at the relationship of a couple of interesting uh, theologians and philosophers like B.B. Uh, Warfield from Princeton, as well as the Dutch prime minister and philosopher Abraham Kuyper, and Alvin Plantinga on the question of general revelation and apologetics, so how you defend your faith. Uh, and, um, and then this one here, uh, thinking about Warfield and Princeton, uh, here he has a book published with Paul Grave, Reason and Faith at Early Princeton, so uh, the time preceding Warfield. Uh, so Dr. Anderson is an, is an expert on questions of uh, early uh, religious life in America and theology and philosophy, as well as uh, he's got the forthcoming uh, Cambridge Companion uh, to the First Amendment, which was the subject that we were looking at last night. Uh, so we're very happy to have uh, Dr. Anderson here, so I'll have you uh, come up, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from what you had to say. Good morning. <clears throat> All right, it's a good-sized group for a, a nice discussion, so I hope one thing we'll do a little different than last night is um, have this also be a little bit conversational. So I might ask questions. I'll try to make sure I pause long enough so that you can feel free to answer and uh, have some conversation about this topic. Um, so in being introduced, as mentioned, that I will do a little bit of autobiographical discussion this morning and uh, my own career, my own interests. But also, we want to talk about this question about God in the secular academy or what's the relationship between God and the secular academy. Or uh, sometimes just put this way, uh, what has... Athens to do with Jerusalem, or what has Jerusalem to do with Athens? I borrowed a book from the back table. I'll put it back so it can you can purchase this if you want. But uh, 
one of the Davenant books is Philosophy and the Christian, The Quest for Wisdom in the Light of Christ. So I have a copy of this, and it's worth reading. I recommend it. It's an edited volume with chapters about this question. Um, so, oh, that's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah, do you want, you want to clean that back? Someone, can, someone should rush back and buy that. There's only one copy back there. Uh, don't, no one get hurt, though. Don't trample each other for it. You can order them online also. Um, now, in my own experience, I didn't plan on staying at ASU so long. It wasn't my goal. I didn't say to myself, I really like being a Sun Devil, uh, although Sun Devil is a kind of a neat mascot. Um, I call myself the Sun Devil Chair of Natural Theology. I think it has a good ring. But, uh, yeah, I've been there this whole time. In academia, that's kind of a, a, a painful story to tell when you're asked at qu conferences. Oh, where did you do your undergraduate? Oh, okay, where did you do your master's degree? Oh, okay, well, where did you do your PhD? Oh, all right. Uh, where did you get tenure? Oh, okay. So it's all, <laughs> ASU is the answer to all those things, right? Just ASU, that's the answer. And then the way I was introduced makes it sound like I don't really leave the area much either, right? He, he did go to Princeton one time. Uh, otherwise, he just likes Tempe a lot. Tempe, Arizona is where he says, I do travel. In fact, uh, I was telling Michael this yesterday. I don't wear this coat a lot in Tempe. I uh, reach in the pocket. And oh, here, this is proof I do get out. This is the uh, Oyster cards from when I was last presenting in Oxford. I went down to London for uh, the day. So... I think it was the next day or a couple days later is when they had that attack on London Bridge, uh, a knife attack. I'd, while I was there a couple days before wandering around seeing the sights. So I do get out. Just wanted proof, right, that it's not just that one time I went to New Jersey. <laughs> um, and I mentioned last night that I was here in Colorado, lived about a mile and a half from here when I was three to five. And in, in my re recollection, that's the first time I heard the gospel um, presented. I still remember Sunday school and the Bible I had and... Uh, both, both hearing it at church and then also talking to my mom about it. So how did I end up at the secular university? Um, well, one of the things that happened was that in high school, I began having questions. I think developmentally, these are pretty standard questions about the meaning of life. Uh, what's the purpose of life? Why, are, why do we do anything? And is there any higher goal? So a lot of the answers I got were sort of proximate goals, right? The meaning of life is that you enjoy yourself or you uh, have a good career to make money so you can enjoy yourself or you have a family so you can enjoy yourself, right? Some, some kind of thing like that, some local goal. And I, I was wondering questions about, well, is there anything, any highest goal, any actual grand purpose to it? So this got me into questions about that, and especially wondering if the things I'd been taught were true. So I'd been taught about God, and I'd been taught about uh, our need for Christ, and I'd been taught about the scriptures, but how do we really know these are true? Especially because in, in high school, I was around people from other religions, and they were equally convicted about their religious beliefs and their special scriptures. And so we could match convictions, table pound, equally well. But that's not really proof, I noticed, right? And in, in their case, their convictions were similar to mine, that they've been told things by their parents and by leaders they respected at their religious establishment. So I, I began to in, be interested in that question, and it naturally led me to certain Christian thinkers like C.S. Lewis and others. But... Um, I wanted to read philosophers more generally, so I enrolled in a philosophy class. And that could be dangerous, right? At a, at a, this was at actually a community college. And uh, I was still in high school, and I wanted to study philosophy, and the one open was ethics. And the first question we began with in ethics was this question, what is the good? It's the first day, first class. Does anybody in here, all young adults, anybody in here know what is the good? And we all knew things that are good in the sense that we could say coffee is good or ice cream is good, but we didn't know what is the good. We hadn't really ever even used the term that way. Have you used it that way? As a noun like that? The good. I didn't know, and neither did the others in the class, and that st stood out to me, that there's something that we should know and we don't know. Some people might try things like this. They might have said God, and that's, a, that's actually a kind of a category mistake. God himself isn't the good. God is good, but what is the goal? What, you, you don't achieve God. You achieve the good. You don't, you don't achieve God. Maybe someone might say you could become God in some religions. Um, or they might say heaven, going to heaven is the good. Happiness. So they, they, they went through some standard ones, and we looked at that, and uh, we all left thinking, wow, we don't know what is the good. So that introduced me. It pinpointed the question I've been worried about, I've been thinking about, about the meaning of life. You can't really have a meaningful life if you don't know that. 
of all things. And, and it, it helped me focus on the fact that when we want a meaningful life, we're, we're trying to know certain things. We want to have knowledge. And that's what makes us stand out from the uh, shaved apes. We want to know. And there's certain basic questions, like uh, how do I know, or what is real, that we want to know the answer to. And we don't want just opinions about those things. Opinions are very cheap. You can get them anywhere, right? An opinion and a, a dollar will buy you a coffee. Uh, and a, a dollar alone will buy you. Does it still buy you a coffee? Nowadays? I used to say an opinion and a dollar will get you a soda from the machine, but that's not true anymore because of inflation. Um, yeah, an opinion three dollars. And opinions, uh, what Socrates tells us, are, are movable. They quickly leave us. They, they're not firm or solid the way knowledge is permanent. Um, so th these questions, what is, how do I know? What is real? Do I believe, is my life mostly based in fiction? One of the uh, favorite American TV characters, Homer Simpson, said, oh, God, he's my favorite fictional character, right? So is belief in God much different than believing in other fictional characters? That's the question in metaphysics, right? What is real? Is God real? What is uh, eternal? And then in ethics about knowledge of what is good and value. So um, these got me into that. And, and those aren't uniquely, say, Christian questions, are they? These are really human questions. So that's going to be part of my answer to the question, what's the, what is the relationship between Athens and Jerusalem? Um, and so I continued pursuing philosophy, interest in philosophy, and interest in uh, philosophy degrees can tend to be very uh, narrow if they're focused, say, on analytic philosophy only or continental philosophy only. So I also wanted to study um, really the ideas of the world. So I did a degree in history as well, history of ideas, and then a master's degree in religious studies, because I especially, I didn't want to just focus on, say, cultural or economic history, which is which are certainly interesting, but I wanted to look at religious ideas. And it was in that context that I was able to study uh, Princeton, Princeton, old school Princeton. I'll tell you about how I got interested in that. Um, so I was doing these things at the Secular Academy. We might think we're not allowed to work on those projects. Uh, and then in my philosophy, my PhD in philosophy of religion, my focus was on the, the idea of culpable ignorance. So proofs for God's existence abound, but there's not usually a lot of focus on this problem, which is that not only does God exist, but it's clear that God exists so that unbelief is without excuse. Do you see how that's a little different? So that, that, that means that there are proofs available to us there's knowledge available to us, which isn't simply high-level technical philosophy PhD knowledge, right? It's knowledge that anybody can understand. Anybody can distinguish God from the creation. Uh, what did Mark Twain say something like that? I know I'm made in the image of God because people often confuse us, <laughs> right? So it's not like that, right? You don't, you don't actually confuse people with God. So I'm, I'm going to bring that question up today. That's also part of the answer to... Jerusalem and Athens. There are some things we can know about God. I'm taking that uh, obviously from Romans 1, but also from Acts 17. Man, like, is this the Canadians out there? <laughs> Maybe they want to join us. Um, so look, we're at Colorado Christian University. What, what do you think makes it uniquely Christian? How's that different than Colorado University? Like, does that change education? Does it change knowledge? Like, is 2 plus 2 equals 4 different when you learn it as a Christian? Or do you have to have a, have a, like, have a footnote that you have 2 plus 2 is 4 in the textbook, a footnote that takes you down and says it has the Bible reference so you know, you know how that's true? Or, or, or is there a, uh, that's, that's the question, right? So uh, there's a couple of different models that people have proposed about the relationship between Athens and Jerusalem? Is it mostly an a aggressive or a conflicting relationship? That they do different, completely different kinds of things. And, and there might be some times where that's true. If you think about the contemporary university, you might, Christians might mostly think about it in terms of a kind of postmodern secularism, which is anti-Christian. And so you'll be paying to get an anti-Christian education, right? So because of that, you might decide, I would rather go to a Christian university well, it won't be anti-Christian. So there is that kind of conflicting reality sometimes. But we're talking right now about the idealized type, not, to, not just the actual education. Or there could be a parallel model 
where they're not necessarily in conflict, but they're doing just different kinds of things. And so because they're different kinds of things, they don't overlap where they could conflict. You guys do your stuff, which is mostly about this world and how to get along in this world, but the Christians do stuff which is mostly about how to get along in the next life, which is more important, they would say, right? So we might borrow a few things from uh, Athens if we also want a comfortable life, but overall the focus is on the next life, and so there's not really a lot of room for conflict. That's another model. Or there could be a transformative model, which says that uh, Jerusalem or Christianity transforms Athens, the university, into what it should be. It's a kind of addition to what was already there. And there's di underneath each one of these, we could look at different uh, ways in which that's done. There could be a, the Thomistic model of that one and the Calvinist model of that one, what it means to transform. So what do you think? What, what made you say to yourself, self, I want to go to a Christian university? You're here. It was a kind of, it's local, it's close. Now, interestingly, uh, as a Christian at a secular university, uh, some might think, well, I didn't want to go to the devil's university where I become an unbeliever, but I've had Christians, of course, come to my classes and they remain Christians. But I've also heard stories, not, not about this university, um, but I have heard stories of students who go to universities in Phoenix that are Christian and leave atheists. So there's no guarantee that if you go to a Christian school, you'll both go in and come out as a Christian, right? So what would make you want to go to a Christian university? And how is that different than uh, what the devils do? We shorten it. We just call ourselves the devils. It's nice. Just get right down to it. The devils. Here's one thing that... I, that uh, if you have an answer to that, raise your hand. I'm trying to pause just long enough if you have an answer, but not too long where it's awkward. Um, uh, here's one thing that happened with me. It was precisely because I was at the secular school, I, I wanted to find out the best challenges to Christian belief out there. Not like the lame, weak challenges, but the best ones out there. And see if I had any way of answering those. That was a way of testing my opinions to see if they're opinions or actual knowledge. And, and, and that test is not merely to see, can I grin and bear it? Can I white-knuckle it through it? Um, that's a kind of focus on the will. That's what a Rocky movie is about. Have you seen any Rocky movies? And I'll always have this wonderful workout montage where he's just grinning, he's just grinning and bearing it through this, white-knuckling it to work out and make it so he can fight. Um, you could do that, right, and get through... Uh, not hearing these challenges, but what I want to do was to absorb the challenges and think, do I have a, a response that uh, addresses this challenge? And that's how I ended up getting into Princeton thought, old school Princeton at Princeton University or Princeton Seminary. My book says uh, Faith and Reason at Early Princeton, and I'm looking at both of those there. I'll have ch little chapters about persons at both. Uh, because the, the, what became Princeton University was founded on these two principles. The first point of their charter was that the student should be pursuing piety and the knowledge of God. Those sound like good goals? This is coming out of the second great, or the first great awakening. Piety and the knowledge of God. And when I was at Princeton, I was able to lead some seminars with students, and I asked them that. I didn't give them any context. I just said, are you here to study piety and the knowledge of God? Like, no, of course not, right? It's not, it's not anywhere on there. But I've seen the charter. It does say that. It's real. So uh, that seems to be foreign to a university. But I'm going to raise a question and say, is that, is that really foreign? I mean, it went not to a Christian university, but to say ASU. But really what that's saying is you should come to university to study what is real and what is good. Put that way, that makes sense, right? And it turns out that God is real. Only God is real in a certain sense of only God is eternal. All other things are dependent on God, created by God. So if we were to study what is real we would find it would, it would turn out, oh yeah, only God is eternal. And that's what Paul emphasizes in Romans 1, the eternal power of God, right? That's unique to God. Other things have power, but not the eternal power, not self-existence. Nothing else self-exists. And that's why idolatry is so glaring, because you're attributing self-existence to something which clearly is not self-existent, eternal power to something else. And, and the sun, S-U-N, has been a... Uh, 
candidate for that in most cultures at some point, right? They call us in, us in Phoenix the sun worshipers. Uh, but everybody say, hey, it's not just us. Everyone's done that, right? But isn't it obvious the sun is not eternal? It doesn't have eternal power. And so to worship the sun as your idol, now the moderns might think they're more sophisticated and they worship their stomachs. I'm not sure that's a better, uh, their appetite, right? Not sure that's a more sophisticated idol, uh, equally problematic. So the university studies what is real, general revelation. And in this, I think there's overlap. Has Athens provided an answer for that? Has Jerusalem provided an answer for that? This is a human problem. Those who are sort of close, we could ask, has Babylon provided an answer for that? Have you, have you read the uh, Babylonian Job? In, uh, you should read this, the Babylonian Job. is very similar to Job. Uh, it, I, don't, I don't know that there's any influence. It's not, it's not a copy of Job, but it's a Babylonian guy who is very pious, he thinks, and goes through suffering, and his friends come and blame him, uh, say that he hasn't done religious duties correctly. And so he goes through this polytheistic thinking about, uh, and, and he ends up just saying, yeah, I guess I just have to be more pious at the end. Uh, do my religious duties better? Uh, and so there's this overlap in terms of this problem of evil, right, that he's questioning. This is a human problem. So the answers may not be correct, right? The answers that come out. This is what Paul encounters at Athens. They don't know God as they should have. But that's the key is that they should have. They could have known God, and they didn't. And that's what the university is studying. And so the, the, the idea of a secular university is a, a university studying general revelation. That's what the word secular can mean, right? Secular doesn't, doesn't mean and shouldn't be taken to mean anti-Christian. But what if secular was like a study of general revelation? And that's what I've been able to do. And that's what Christian universities should study as well, all the more. Shouldn't a Christian university do even better at studying general revelation? Like, just like uh, Paul did even better in Athens than the philosophers did. They were stuck in... Uh, a, argument between Stoicism and Epicureanism, and they had assumptions that he drew their attention to that they hadn't thought of. Now, interestingly, notice, I brought this out last night with Socrates also, notice that they, it didn't persuade everybody. Socrates didn't persuade everybody. He, it, it was a close vote. I didn't say that last night. It was a close vote. It wasn't unanimous against him, but he, he didn't get the majority. And, and Paul doesn't get the majority either, does he? Or at least, I, we don't know, I guess, the majority, but he doesn't persuade everybody. So, he does move them, though. Some of them scoff. They go further into darkness. And some of them say, we'd like to hear more. And that's what a, a study of work of general revelation can do. Now, what, what's the benefit of uh, Princeton? How did I get into that? I actually got into that from an R.C. Sproul lecture. I don't know if you know of R.C. Sproul. But he was talking about uh, Kuiper and Warfield and uh, the role of apologetics. Is there any purpose to apologetics? If all humans are fallen and no work of your own can bring you to be regenerated as a work of the Holy Spirit, then apologetics is only for Christians. It's kind of an in-house discussion about how we know Christianity is true, and there's not really any need to do it with the unbeliever, right? That becomes a kind of, it, it might get into works righteousness, where you're telling them if you just know the right arguments, you can save yourself. So that's a, that's a reformed critique sometimes given, and, and Kuiper sometimes said things like this about apologetics, and so Warfield argued back about that, and gave a kind of robust defense about why we need apologetics. And he had Kuiper over, and they had a, a presentation and discussion about it. So that led me from uh, Warfield, why we need apologetics, and why apologetics is not a problem for uh, the fall or regeneration. It's not, it's not a tension with that. And to uh, Warfield's teachers, Ky uh, Hodge, and it led me to the question, what happened to Princeton? that it, it no longer, this is called old school Princeton, right? It's not what they're teaching now. Now, when I was there as a visiting scholar, uh, the, pro the professors were arguing and not talking to each other because they had different views of how to understand Karl Barth. That was their arguments. No, no Hodge was on the table. Um, so what happened? Well, I think what happened was this. In, in a quick, quick discussion, and we can flesh it out later, uh, challenges were raised about the knowledge of God and weren't addressed. The answers given were insufficient. And so those answers were jettisoned in favor of what people thought were sufficient answers. It was a kind of non-cognitive turn, I would call it. Hodge is sometimes critiqued for being too rationalistic. 
And so the turn was away from that to a non-cognitive form of Christianity at first, and then a non-cognitive form of not Christian, or anti-Christian sometimes at Princeton. So that puts the, the burden on us, say at a Christian university, or Christians in general, how are we doing in responding to challenges? Have we mostly been fideists, accepting what we're told on blind faith, and fideism is especially uh, used in the context of otherworldliness. I have enough to get into heaven. I don't need to do more than that. This world is passing away. Would you pause to polish brass on the Titanic? No, of course not. So fideism, I wouldn't expect that a fideism like that and otherworldliness would do very well in explaining university, right? Or the kinds of work of general revelation. And it's what is uh, viewed by secular skeptics when they reject religion. It's what Marx meant when he said, religion is the opiate of the masses. And you might initially have a response to that, say, no, it's not. But look and, look and consider the religions Marx was looking at. And were they doing much more than a kind of otherworldly morphium right, to get through life? Were they providing robust answers to give people meaning? Were they showing what's clear about God and the law from general revelation? And if they weren't doing that, then it shouldn't surprise us that Marx rejected them, right, and offered something else. And so what a Christian would need to do is... Uh, see that challenge, if we have fallen into other wilderness, repent of that, and provide the answers that are needed to show knowledge, to provide meaning in life. I think that's what Christianity does have to offer, uh, especially about the most basic questions that we can ask. We can provide knowledge with those, not merely assertion. And so that's what's kept me interested in the secular university, secular in that sense of world, the world as the works of God. This is how the Westminster Confession begins that the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God so as to leave men without excuse. So all three of those, the light of nature, reason, and the works of God in creation and providence, history, reveal God and the nature of God. I'll give you homework. Did you know you're going to get homework this morning? You can look up uh, chapter 21 of the Confession. It gets even more detailed about what we can know from the light of nature. It's a lot of stuff that we should know, not by quoting scripture, but from the light of nature. And we know all these things without scripture. And what scripture does is provides an, an explanation, an answer about the problem of redemption. That's the next part of the, the uh, quote I just gave you. The, these are not sufficient for salvation. And we need salvation because we're inexcusable, and we're inexcusable because we didn't know God as we should have. And so Christians of anybody should be able to then know God as they should have, right? So this is what I think uh, we see illustrated in Paul in Athens in uh, chapter 17, Acts 17, and what the Christian heritage has. So when we talk about, when Davenant talks about doing uh, retrieval work, this is what you can say, what is being retrieved? The best uh, minds of Christianity and what they've thought on these topics, retrieving those for the present so we have access to those gems as we face current challenges that come up. And, and one last thing, to note for me is that as I study the history of ideas, one benefit is that you find out in one way there aren't any new challenges. So we were, uh, we had at ASU a guy named Lawrence Krauss, who's a well-known materialist cosmologist. He wrote a book called Universe, A Universe from Nothing, and was arguing that uh, he'd proven that, that the whole universe can come into existence from nothing. He, at first you might say, amen, brother, because you're thinking creation ex nihilo, no. From, from absolute nothing, right? No, no, nothing preceding it. Now, if you read carefully, it turns out that he defines nothing as quantum foam. And then you'll say, wait, 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 that's not nothing. And he'll say, oh, you, you thought I meant absolute nothing? Yes, that's what I thought the word nothing meant, was nothing, right? Um, but you'll find out, you know what, this is, and, and, and it'll be put in this sense, this is what the, the best co materialist physics cosmology has presented us with, right? Who are you to doubt that? Are you some kind of Luddite? Well, yeah, but no, you don't, want to, you don't want to be called that, right? Well, then you, if you know about the history of ideas, you'll know, well, this is just Epicurus. This is just Lucretius. This is nothing new. There are just atoms and the void. Those are the only two things that exist. And we should have a good response to that, right? So we should be, if we're familiar with the 
debates of the past, the challenges in the past, we should be able to respond to them because we'll see, yeah, there's not really some new challenge under the sun. They didn't invent something new. We've already dealt with the atomic theory, atomism, right? Atoms in the void. And we should have that at our hand. We shouldn't be uh, shocked and, and discard our belief in God and say, oh, maybe atoms in the void have eternal power. No, only God has eternal power. So that's why I would recommend at the university, Christian or otherwise, acquainting yourselves with the best challenges in order to see do you know or do you only think you know? Do you actually have meaning? Are you really any different from other fideists and other religions? Can you provide knowledge for yourself first, not just for someone asking you questions, but are you satisfied yourself that you know? That's the examined life, beginning with yourself. I say that because I don't want you to rush out and start questioning your professors, and then I'll get nasty emails. Uh, why are you telling my students to question me? And I have it on record that I told them to question themselves first. Now, what, what do you think? If you, if you could get uh, meaning in life from paying to go to university, would that be worth it? Yeah, maybe like, do I still get the degree? Yeah, you'll still get the degree. And you have knowledge of God. Would that be worth it? Did you think that when you applied to university, that that's what you'd be applying for? I wonder, I speak from, say, ASU, is that sometimes the university might be turned into a kind of trade school, right, where you mostly go to university to be taught a job, and that's not bad. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We do need a trade. Um, but historically, the idea of university is different than that. It's more than that. It's the pursuit of knowledge about these topics, right? So what if you got both that training in a job and to know God? All right. Is there an extra test? Well, life is the test, actually, right? Suffering is the test. The world will test you, even if it's not, you don't, you don't bump in, you go down the corridor and bump into a postmodern philosopher and they test you, but life will test you, right? Like it did with the Babylonian Job and it did with the biblical Job, and you'll be uh, tested to see if you actually know or if your answers fall away from you as soon as they're tested. That's why Plato uses that image in Socrates of uh, difference between knowledge and opinion, lasting versus not lasting. And when your opinions are just opinions, they're not knowledge, and they're tested, they just kind of evaporate. They, they don't last. So I get that same response from my students. Is that all students are the same, right? This kind of same response when I say, what if you also could have knowledge of God? Well, okay, I guess. Do I still, but I still know how to be an accountant? Yes, you'll still be able to be an accountant. But that's what a university's for. So that's my answer to Athens and Jerusalem. The purpose of the university is to know what is clear about God. And I'd like you to think of, we're going to have some questions later, think of the best challenges you can think of to that. You might not have it. You might say, yeah, that sounds great. But really, what, what challenges do you have about that? Including this one. It's too hard to know God. We need, we need, that's why we need professional religious priests. They study to know God and just tell the rest of us, and we believe it on authority because it's so difficult. Or uh, we're too busy. I've got too much going on in life. I can't spend time trying to know God. Right? Aquinas said this, first one. These are very difficult proofs, so you have to kind of just have the Bible and trust the Bible that God exists. Uh, but there are proofs for the philosophers. And then Locke said the second one. There are these proofs. He gives some fantastic proofs. Uh, book 4, part 10 of the essay, if you want to look it up. And he says, it's certain that God exists. It's as certain as the existence of myself. And he goes through some examples of that. But then he says, people are really busy. And we can't expect them to spend time on that. So trust me, God exists. And I'm suggesting the alternative that even if you're busy, because we're all busy, and even if you're not a professional philosopher, who'd, who'd ever want to be that? Uh, some things about God are clear so that all humans are without excuse, not just the philosophers or just the layabouts, the not busy aristocrats, I guess. Who's not busy? So that's what the university's uh, about, knowing God. And, and you can imagine what happens when it doesn't teach that, when it goes to seed, how it becomes a kind of... Uh, at best, a place to get a job, but not providing with meaning? Would you want to revolt against that? Would you want to pay $60,000 to not get meaning? Doesn't sound like a good plan to me. You might, and that might be cheap. You might be thinking, wow, there's a place where I can only spend 60000 right? This is great. What, what's that place called? ASU. This is a plug for ASU. Well, we're probably less than that even. 
Yeah, we're less than that. And that's why it was very cruel for someone to say in the news recently when she was asked about why she helped her daughter cheat to get into USC, and she said, well, I didn't want my kid to end up at ASU. Right? Yeah. Why do we keep being the ones that get picked on? It happened with Henry Kissinger when he left Harvard. A reporter asked him, what will you do now? And he said, well, there's always Arizona State. And it happened with Ned Flanders. When he was in heaven, he saw Homer Simpson. And he said, Homer Simpson's in heaven? It must be easier to get into heaven than into Arizona State. Right? And now we've got it with uh, USC at ASU, right? It's not nice. We do... I heard there's a guy there that teaches clear God exists. If you heard that about university, would you want your kids to go? That's what I heard about ASU. All right, question? All right, so, okay. Do you do questions now or at the end of the ball three? Okay. So what I'll do is I'll lay out a framework. The question was, what's your go-to proof that, for, what was the phrase, any idiot? What's your go-to proof? Yeah. For any idiot. Any idiot, yeah. Uh, that's always a difficult choice when I'm buying a book about how to do something. Am I an idiot, a dummy, or a fool, right? <laughs> Trying to decide which, which one of those. And so there is, a, or a simpleton, there's for the simple also. And there's a philosopher's guide from each one, right? The philosophy made simple, philosophy for dummies. Um, so yeah, what's a, a go-to quick? So what I'll do is I'll lay out a framework, and then we'd have to get into more details when we have a little more time, right? I'm not, I don't think clear means easy in the subjective sense where it's easy to lift this cup compared to 50 pounds. Uh, clear means something like this. The distinction between A and non-A is a clear difference. No one confuses those, and if you do, you're culpable. So the same with God. God and non-God are clearly different, and that's what is the basis of any idolatry is confusing God with something else. So that's the basic framework I would use. I think that's exactly what Paul's doing in Romans 1. I think it's what the first commandment does. I think it's what the greatest commandment does. So we see this in the beginning of the law. The law always begins with God, right? Um, so, the, so the emphasis is on the eternal power of God. God has existed from eternity. And so when we're asking if God exists, what we're asking is, what is eternal? And we can categorize the world systems in their answers to that. There's only so many answers. There's really just two, really, because... One, you might think none is eternal as an option. Nothing has existed from eternity, and that's what that guy Lawrence Krauss supposedly was going to tell us. But anytime you look into such a system, you'll find out that, 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 that nothing is something, because you, precisely because you can't get something from nothing, right? So, so there aren't any world systems that say nothing has existed from eternity. All of them say something has, and there are only even a few options there. The material universe has existed from eternity, or my soul has existed from eternity, both together have existed from eternity, right? Plato. Um, and then in contrast to that, th that's a system that says all is eternal. In contrast to that, only God is eternal. God the creator, and God made the heavens and the earth. So that would be the framework, quote, for any idiot. Any idiot can distinguish, and I put myself in that category. I'm not using the word about others. Uh, I have a medal as idiot of the year. Uh, any, any person can distinguish eternal without beginning from not eternal with beginning. Right? I could go around the room and I could point to things and you'd be able to tell me if they're eternal or not eternal, right? And the things in the room would all be not eternal because they're material objects. So then would you somehow think that the universe itself has existed from eternity? That's what Lucretius or Epicurus thought. Aristotle, the dualists, right? Sometimes Christians get excited about Aristotle or Plato because they'll use words we translate as God. So they'll say things like, Plato will be found to say things like, knowing God is the highest good. And you think, oh, this is great. He read the shorter catechism. <laughs> right? <laughs> but then you need to look into his system, and you'll find out, oh, wait, this is a Greek dualist. He believes God is not the eternal, doesn't have eternal power at all, does not create the world, and the material world has existed from eternity, and so has the human soul. This is an important part of the republic discussion about reincarnation at the end, and the human soul is going through reincarnation until it becomes just. So think about that for a minute. Here's an example of, of the method each time about what's eternal. If you have existed from eternity, and you'll continue to reincarnate until you're just, and you're still reincarnating, do you have any hope of ever becoming just? How much more time do you need than from eternity? <laughs> like, like, that's the kid's game, right? Uh, infinity, infinity plus one, right? Well, if I just had one more life, then I would become 
just. And any system of reincarnation will have this, a Hindu system as well. And they'll have to wrestle with that. And so then they might say something like, my soul hasn't always existed. It's not eternal because of that problem. I would have already been at justice, right? I would have already had a just soul. So Plato, Aristotle, Greek dualists, or monists like uh, Epicurus, are attributing the eternal power of God to something else. Now, I think that that's very straightforward and clear difference. Only God is eternal without beginning. And to worship anything else in that place is the, the very definition of idolatry. I don't know if he had it this morning, but in one of my, on the cover of one of my books the, on the natural moral law, I have a painting of Aeneas carrying his father Anchises from the flames of Troy. And you see Anchises reaching back and he's grabbing his household idols to take with him. Now, what do you think about that? What strikes you? Remember, this is Aeneas carrying Anchises as Troy burns down. And Anchises is reaching back to get his household idol. What stands out to you? Yeah, the, Troy's on fire, right? If this guy can do anything, at least he would hopefully prevent Troy from burning down. He didn't. And so the, the book talks about this, the transfer of, of idolatry. Then Aeneas founds Rome on these same idols. And, and, the, and I'm using idol not just as this, this little chap right here, but conceptual idolatry in the way that uh, replacing God, we, we might be proud of ourselves. I don't have a little Zeus in my house that I bow down to, but we may very well have conceptual idols. We misconceive of God, and we make God to be like us. Ludwig Feuerbach said this, that if you want to know a man, show me his God, because the God is just a projection of the man. It's the same as him, made writ large in heaven. And he's right, right? Most of the time that is true. We fall into conceptual idolatry. So I think that's the basis for an answer is there's a clear difference between God and the creation. Now, I think in, in these kind of systems, what they might say is they might concede there's a creator, but then they'll say, he's so remote and distant, he has nothing to do with us, and you have to pray to the more local ones in charge, right? Uh, and I don't think you can get away with that, because if God is infinite, and, and I think eternal and infinite go together, if God is absolute, the highest power, you can't be the highest power and not aware or concerned with what's going on. So that's another uh, form of conceptual idolatry. You've misunderstood the infinity of God and attributed it to something else, as if Zeus or Moloch or Chemosh could be more caring than the eternal creator. And that's where you'll get someone who cares about you, right? This is, this is absurd, isn't it? It's inexcusable. And that's a human condition. And that's a condition we're all happy to be redeemed out of. Yeah. Are you saying that the goodness of God is a... Are you saying that the goodness of God is a logical implication of omnipotence? I think the goodness of God follows from God being the creator. That if God created with infinite intentional wisdom, God can't be either amoral, doesn't care, or evil. So the goodness of God follows from the fact that God is a creator. God made things as he wanted them. And we see that emphasized in Genesis, right? Each, each time it said, and he looked and saw it was good. God made the world good. That act of creating is making things with natures, and the good for a thing is according to the nature of a thing, what that thing is. So I think that follows, those are different qualities. You asked if it follows from omnipotence. I'm saying those are going together as part of being the eternal creator. You'd also have to be all-knowing. Whatever is eternal would know all things. If, if after eternity, is why I gave the example with reincarnation, right? If after eternity, if the goal of reincarnation is for you to, to come to have this kind of enlightenment, and after eternity, you haven't had that. Do you really have any hope that you'll ever get it? If I just had another reincarnation. I put it this way for my students, because they're not so worried about their future reincarnations, they're worried about their tests. And if I say, if you failed a test from infinity, do you have any hope that maybe if you take it one more time, you'll pass? Like, wouldn't you give up a lot sooner than infinity? Like, I think there's like a cap usually, like three, three failed class three times, you can't retake it. Some students petition that, so they might really be going, oh, I'll try it four times or five times, but after about five or six, wouldn't you give up and say, this just is not my class, right? And that's five, not I've existed from eternity. 
And that's, that seems to be clear, right? This is why you probably end up making a distinction in reincarnation systems between the true self and the apparent self. Even there, though, it doesn't solve the problem because the goal of enlightenment is to come to identify your apparent self with the true self. But if you've been trying to do that from eternity and haven't done it yet, what hope is there? Right? Yeah. So you're in your church, and uh, either a, uh, a family comes to you, parents, and said, um, our son is going to go off to university next year, and he has an opportunity to go to such and such secular school or such and such Christian school. Um, and sort of a, based on your own personal experience in the secular academy and uh, your knowledge on generally where Christian universities might be at, and this is obviously very, I know, case by case, but yeah. on a, if you could overgeneralize a little bit, um, thinking of pros and cons, might you lean one way or the other towards advising yeah, I would. So, giving advice to a family about where to send their child for university, um, it, it would be highly situational. I know that's not the answer you want, but it would depend on the kids' aptitudes and personality in this sense, not in terms of how well do they do on the SAT. Well, then send them to USC. Oh, they did this. Well, then send them to ASU. No, <laughs> don't do that. That's not that's not what I mean at all. What I mean is how well do they do in facing challenges. So, in my case, uh, just in terms of my personality. Uh, I, I wasn't bothered by being challenged, and it wasn't something that uh, I, I did want to follow the arguments. So it wasn't as if I said, I'm going to believe this no matter what someone says. Uh, but I, I wasn't worried or fearful about having them challenged and then looking for an a, a coherent answer. Uh, but I think some people don't like doing that. It makes them uncomfortable. And, and, and so it, it, would, it would depend, I guess. My advice would be if they go to the secular university, they probably will have significant challenges in that way. But there could, it could be that if they want those challenges and they go to a Christian university and, and they're not given much beyond fideism, um, I, I know students who have left the faith because of that. So that going to a university, a Christian university doesn't guarantee anything if the student wants those kind of challenges. So I, so I would say get to know your child and also how well have you prepared the child up to this point? Uh, have they been given a, a solid foundation in these things, in, in basic truths of the faith? Or will, will going to uh, university be the first time they hear about these challenges? So, so the first time you hear about uh, critical uh, higher criticism is a university, that might be shocking. Like, what, there's higher criticism? But I think high you know, kids in high school can be made aware of these kind of challenges before they get to university. So I think it would, I, I wish I had a better answer. I guess I'm supposed to say, always send them to ASU, right? <laughs> but I, I like, uh, I say this, of course you like ASU. You've been there for so long. Um, but again, ASU has provided a lot of freedom to study. I was able to do a degree of studying Warfield at ASU. I'm not sure you'd be allowed to do that at Biola. I don't know for sure. So why, why are you throwing Biola out there? I throw Biola out there because I've taught natural law, I've taught a class on natural law there before. So I like Biola. But I don't know that they do that kind of focus, right? They have a different focus. So I was able to study that uh, at ASU. So um, that's a nice kind of freedom. Well, I think we'll we'll close now, um, and so thank you again, Dr. Anderson, yeah. for your presentation. Exactly. And so we'll. It's ten o'clock. So what? Take maybe. Uh, well, maybe, maybe we'll just do the two, and then we'll have a break. You want to do the two and do have a break? Okay, that's yeah. good. So we can have Dr. Copeland come up. So I'll I'll hand this over to you. have a little bit of a break and then we'll go to our panel discussion. Um, but uh, uh, thank you um, certainly for all showing up this morning. Um, I just want to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Thomas Kixier. He's our professor of politics here at Colorado Christian University. Uh, Dr. Copeland has his bachelor's degree from Geneva College. Uh, as well, he has a master's and a PhD from the University of Pittsburgh with a focus on public and international affairs. Uh, Dr. Copeland uh, has not only been um, serving as a teacher, but he's had a number of public policy positions. Uh, for example, he served on the faculty as the on the faculty advisory board of the American Enterprise Institute's Values and Capitalism Project. He's also um, been a fellow with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, and he's also previously uh, been a professor at Geneva College and the aforementioned uh, Biola University. Actually, I think Biola was just uh, where you were just before you came uh, to Colorado. 
Um, he's also served um, formerly as the Chief of Staff in the Government Services Division of LexisNexis, and also um, he has been a Director of Admissions at the Institute of World Politics, and uh, he has actually worked at the Office of Naval Research as well. He's the um, editor um, of one book and the author of another. He has edited the book "Drawing a Line in the Sun." Uh, sorry, "Drawing a Line in the Sea." Uh, again, we talked about this. You know, being academics, how often you need to come up with catchy titles, uh, uh, whether they sell books or not. Uh, at least make the effort. Uh, the book is called um, "Drawing a Line in the Sea: The 2010 Gaza Flotilla Incident and the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict," published by Lexington Press. He is also the author of the book, Fool Me Twice, Intelligence Failure and um, uh, Mass Casualty Terrorism. I mean, that actually sounds kind of, that's got some grip to it, that one. That uh, certainly could be uh, worth looking at. And that's published by Brill, um, uh, Martinez Nyhoff uh, as well. Uh, so that's uh, two of his books. And Tom is going to come in, uh, talk to us a little bit about, we've been sort of, last night we looked at the question of religion and religious liberty in America here. Um, uh, Dr. Anderson gave us a really insightful look at the whole role of the First Amendment in our uh, American culture. And today we talked a little bit about the academy. Well, as a n typical North American way, we often look fondly back at the old world. And Tom is going to talk a little bit about what's going on in Europe in terms of religious liberty, what is going on uh, in terms of religious thought, and hopefully that will give us some more insight onto what we know happening here. Thank you very much. So, Tom? Some of us who are vertically challenged have to adjust the microphone. Um, well, welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, I recognize a few faces. Um, some of you thought you could get away from Dr. Copeland for at least a Saturday, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm back again for the CCU students. Um, Thank you to, uh, to the Davidon Institute and to Michael Plato for the invitation to, uh, to speak. Um, what I want to do is, is more, of a, more of an update or a briefing uh, than a thesis or, or argument um, about the, the state of religion in Europe. Um, and you can see from the title, again, I'm, I'm still on this kick with trying to find catchy titles for things. Um, I was trying to do a take, this, calling it God's Not Dead in Europe yet. I was trying to do a take off on the, the God's Not Dead films. Um, Steve Schumacher asked me if this was actually an homage to uh, Monty Python and the line about, I'm not dead yet. Um, so I guess it's maybe a combination of, of things, but hopefully catchy anyway. Um, what I'm going to try to do is, is draw together seven trends uh, in, in Europe, seven religious trends uh, in Europe. And I think although American churches have sent out hundreds of thousands of missionaries over the years, we're still remarkably uninformed about the global church. We may be generally aware of the incredible growth in the church in China, and the recent persecution of believers there. Um, we track the persecution and murder of Christians in places like Syria and Nigeria. Um, perhaps somewhat less noticed is the rise of Pentecostalism in Latin America with the continued theological conservatism of African churches. When it comes to Europe, my sense is that evangelicals are equally, if not more, ignorant of the trends in Christianity. For example, we hear that only 2% of the population attends church. Islam and Sharia are taking over and the Catholic Church is in crisis, and the Pope is a socialist. Now, there's perhaps a grain of truth in each of those ideas, but I want to separate sort of the fake news from what I think are some deeper religious currents in Europe. So, as, I, as the title says, God's not dead in Europe, at least not yet. Uh, the broadest, uh, the first, I think the broadest and most important trend, of course, is the continued growth of secularism in Europe. Uh, several years ago, uh, Catholic scholar George Weigel wrote a book called The Cube and the Cathedral. And in it, he contrasts the secular vision that produced La Grande Arche de la Défense in Paris, this postmodern monstrosity, with the Christian vision that produced Notre Dame Cathedral. Weigel expressed great concern that the new EU constitution of 2004 <coughs> intentionally left out the Christian history of Europe as a source of its values. Indeed, he questions whether the European Union can, Union can survive as a democratic polity when it has lost both its foundation and with it any hope for the future. He suggests that the declining birth rate in Europe is actually a sign that people really have no long-term hope or plans for the future. Just look at the leaders of EU countries. 
few, if any of them, actually have their own children. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's recent comment about not having children because the world will end in 12 years is sort of an American echo of this European secularism and soft socialism and the lack of hope. Now, there are a number of signs, I would say, of growing uh, secularism. For one, church attendance has plummeted all across Europe. One survey suggests that roughly 15% of French citizens attend church weekly, 10% in the UK. Less than 6% of Dutch citizens attend uh, in the land of Abraham Kuyper, and only 2% of Russians attend regularly. So this, by the way, does debunk the claim that only 2% of Europeans go to church regularly. It's just that the answer is somewhere between 2 and 15%. It's still very low. Some countries are far down the road to secularism. 62% of Norwegians now say they do not believe in God or don't know if he exists. In 1985, only 10% of Norwegians said they did not believe. But secularism is not just being foisted upon the European people. There are deeper patterns of secular belief already in existence. Uh, the Pew Research Center just completed a massive study on Christianity in Western Europe surveying 25,000 respondents. And here's some of the important things that they discovered. While most uh, adults consider themselves Christians, many of them are not practicing their faith. In every country except Italy, non-practicing Christians outnumber church attenders. In the United Kingdom, 55% are non-practicing versus the 18% who attend church at least once a month. These non-practicing Christians still outnumber the religiously unaffiliated, or nuns, and all Muslims, Jews, and Hindus combined in Europe. But religious nuns, that would be including atheists and former believers, have grown in direct relationship with the decline of religious conviction in Europe. 48% of Netherlanders are nuns, down to, 20, down to 15% in places like Ireland, Italy, and Portugal, but the median is 24%. Furthermore, here are some of the things that they believe among non-practicing Christians. 24% believe in God as described in the Bible. 23% believe in God with absolute certainty. Compare that to uh, American nuns who have no religious affiliation, and 24% of them at least believe in God with absolute certainty. This is 23% of those who claim to be Christian and simply not practicing. Majorities of non-practicing Christians also say that science makes religion unnecessary for them personally or even nationally. And large majorities also favor both legalized abortion and same-sex marriage. The trends among European young people are equally dire. Most, re most recent European social survey finds that more and more young people are not identifying with or practicing religion. In the UK, only 7% of youth identify as Anglican, 10% as Catholic, 6% as Muslim. 91% of young people in the Czech Republic claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. Likewise, in the UK, France, Spain, and the Netherlands, between 56 and 60% say they never go to church. With the exception of Catholic youth in Poland, Lithuania, and Ireland, the vast majority of young people in Europe are now unchurched. Now, I would also suggest that some of European secularism actually began inside the church. There's a serious lack of religious knowledge among the faithful. According to another recent survey uh, done by Ligonier Ministries uh, of Brits, one-third of Brits say, I don't know, when asked whether trust in Jesus alone leads to salvation, whether the resurrection actually occurred, or about the nature of the Trinity, the existence of hell, or Jesus' return. Furthermore, so that was, that was British citizens in general. This is now back to the question of practicing Christians. So leaving aside non-practicing, this is among practicing Christians in the UK. Sorry, these are coming up slowly. 47% believe the Bible is not literally true. 49% say religious belief is a matter of personal opinion. 64% say God accepts the worship of all religions. 
And 70% say the Holy Spirit is a force, not a personal being. Star Wars fans can't even agree on what the nature of the force is, uh, but clearly Christians in Britain um, are part of the same, have the same question. Uh, British pastors who were interviewed, who, who uh, commented on the Ligonier study, noted that there is clearly work to be done uh, in the pulpits of England. Um, but I'm sure the same is true across Europe. So, to conclude, I mean, secularism really is now, I would say, the dominant religion in Europe, driven by the European political elite and by culture. Secondly, or second trend, the shifting ground of religious freedom in Europe is intimately tied to that rise of secularism. This is particularly interesting, I think, when it comes to critiques of Islam, but there are a number of ways in which this trend is evolving. Uh, in Britain, the state education agency is actively targeting faith-based schools for failing to promote transgenderism and gender reassignment, even to children under age eight. Amanda Spielman, the head of British schools, said, it is right that we use compulsory education to make children acquire a deep understanding of and respect for British values, even if they are in tension with parental wishes or with community norms. Now, ironically, uh, the Birmingham public schools were forced to backtrack on implementing this same LGBT curriculum when hundreds of Muslim families pulled their children from the school in a day of protest. But Spielman backed the school in this case as well saying it was vital that children knew about, quote, families that have two mummies or two daddies. Freedom, uh, freedom of speech seems to be growing, uh, by contrast, in some parts of Europe. Ireland recently voted by a 65-35 margin to remove its laws on blasphemy. The UK abolished its blasphemy law in 2008, Netherlands in 2012, Iceland and Norway in 2015. Uh, Denmark abolished their blasphemy law just in 2017 to avoid having to prosecute a man who posted a video on Facebook of himself burning a Quran. So national blasphemy laws, for the most part, are coming down. But the sands keep shifting. The European Court of Human Rights recently ruled that referring to Muhammad as a pedophile because he married his youngest wife at age six and consummated the marriage at age nine is, as they said, an improper or even abusive attack on an object of religious veneration that is likely to incite religious intolerance. In other words, the ECHR has created a tacit blasphemy law, although it was never passed by the European Parliament or any other legislative body. The threat of violent reaction to religious offense or blasphemy is not an idle one. The most, fam most famous case uh, cases of this include the huge backlash in 2005 over cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad in a newspaper in the Netherlands and the terrorist attack in 2015 on the Charlie Hebdo uh, magazine offices after the uh, editors published cartoons of, of Muhammad. So this is clearly what the ECHR is afraid of happening uh, when, uh, when making, writing this, this ruling on, on blasphemy. So it's clear that the trends in religious free speech um, are moving in two different directions simultaneously. And I don't think that tension can last for long. Countries which have abolished their blasphemy laws will find themselves frequently overruled by the European Court on Human Rights, or worse, the ECHR will, will essentially determine that free speech simply doesn't apply when speaking about Islam. So the current situation is untenable. Third, the third trend, challenges to the Catholic Church. It seems that new revelations come out almost every month in the 30-year-long uh, ongoing scandal of sex abuse inside the Catholic Church. Last fall, they included the Pennsylvania Attorney General's report, new investigations in New Jersey and New York, and new details of abuse at seminaries. The most recent news on this front is that the Vatican's treasurer, Cardinal George Pell, has been convicted of child sex abuse in Australia and sentenced to six years in jail. The former Archbishop of Washington, D.C., Theodore McCarrick, long a power broker inside the Catholic Church, was recently defrocked from the priesthood after a church court found him guilty of sexually abusing minors. Pope Francis has received a lot of heat over this as he seemed to cover for McCarrick for many years before finally handing down this, this judgment. Francis also recently acknowledged a huge global problem with sex abuse of nuns. Now, he, the, the Pope recently held a four-day summit on sex abuse 
inviting presidents of bishops' councils from all over the world. But as the New York Times headline put it, Pope Francis ends landmark sex abuse meeting with strong words but few actions. Critics were stunned and outraged that the meetings resulted in no concrete plans for addressing sex abuse in the church, leaving most of the work to changing hearts and minds to local bishops. Now, scandals in the church, such as this, have contributed to declining religiosity among the faithful. According to that same Pew study, 53% of European nuns, uh, non-believers or former believers, who were raised in the church cited scandals involving religious institutions and leaders as a factor in their decision to stop identifying with the faith of their fathers. Church scandals also appear to be connected to the declining number of Catholic priests and nuns. This is especially true in Europe, with the number of priests decreased by more than 2,500 in 2014 alone. So Pope Francis has reopened conversations on whether it might be possible to ordain married men of faith to serve in remote areas where there's a shortage of priests. So I would suggest that these scandals in the Catholic Church may lead to not only greater doubt among Catholics, but will make evangelism harder and has reduced the moral authority with which the Catholic Church speaks into social issues. Now, the rise of Islam in Europe is another indicator that God's not dead in Europe. Now, if what was being spread was a modernist, open Islam that sought accommodation with democratic values and embraced religious pluralism, that would be one thing. But the Islam seemingly gaining the most traction in Europe is of the fundamentalist or Salafist variety. It seeks to undermine democratic values and has no tolerance for either Christianity or Judaism. So I don't see the spread of Islam in Europe as a good thing. Now, there's great fear of Islam in some corners of Britain in particular. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, radical imams like Abu Hamza and Anjum Chaudhry were given a free pass to preach jihad uh, until the 2005 London subway and bus bombings. After that, British authorities cracked down on speech inciting terrorism. But London is still a hotbed of Islamic radicalism. According to the Gaystone Institute, there are 462 mosques in London and over 100 Sharia courts operating inside the city. Only two of the 1,700 mosques in Britain at large subscribe to what we call a modernist interpretation of Islam. And in fact, by 2015, the most common name in England was Muhammad. Now, a large part of the, the fear on the continent comes from the recent influx of well over a million Syrians, many of them Muslim. There's a public perception that Islam will soon take over all of Europe. But according to the Pew Research Center, Muslims currently make up just 4.9% of the population of Europe. You can see that the percentage of Muslims uh, varies from a tiny fraction in places like Portugal in the west and the Baltic states in the east, whereas it makes up over 6% of the population in Germany and the UK and over 8% in Sweden and France. Using a variety of uh, statistical models, Pew projects that if the mass migrations in 2015 and 16 end, which they have for the most part, uh, the Muslim population will rise to something like 11% of the overall European numbers by 2050. At the same time, though, Europe's native population is expected to, to decline by almost 40 million thanks to death and low fertility rates. Now, the refugee crisis has generated uh, all kinds of uh, public safety challenges in Europe, from rape gangs roaming the streets of some British and Swedish cities, to the infamous mass sexual assault of a thousand women in Cologne, Germany on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, the countries in Europe with the highest rates of rape and sexual assault, as Britain, Sweden, France, Belgium, and Germany, also have the highest percentage of non-indigenous Muslims living there. So recent immigration seems to be the key factor. Uh, the headlines about crimes committed by migrants are scary and attention-grabbing. And they're accurate about the severity of the nature of the problem, although, if anything, they probably underreport the volume of incidents. Street violence and riots are also a problem. In 2005, there were three weeks of rioting across France that resulted in nearly 3,000 arrests, nearly 9,000 vehicles burned, and 200 million euros in damages. Just last week, there were several days of Muslim riots in Grenoble, France. 
And there are frequent riots, or riots in and around refugee camps from Greece on across Europe. Now, of course, terrorism is also a concern with the Muslim population in several parts of Europe, particularly France and Belgium. The 9-11 hijackers were radicalized during their time in Germany. And there have been a number of high-profile terrorist attacks in France, uh, from the Charlie Hebdo murders, to the truck attack in Nice that killed 86 people, to the Bataclan theater shooting that killed 130. And that event's planners were radicalized and trained and eventually caught in, uh, in Belgium. Now, the fifth trend uh, to talk about briefly is rising Semitism, anti-Semitism. Europe has a long, long history, of course, of anti-Semitism, culminating in the Holocaust of six million Jews by German Nazis. But that anti-Semitism has not gone away, and in fact is on the rise again in Europe. The problem seems to begin with attitudes and knowledge. CNN sponsored a poll of 7,000 Europeans last year with startling results. One-third of respondents said they know next to nothing about the Holocaust. One in 20 said they had never heard of the Holocaust. And 25% of French millennials and 12% of Austrian youth had never heard of it. So the land, the, the country that birthed Hitler, only 12% of young people, uh, not only, I'm sorry, 12% had never heard of the Holocaust. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, more than a quarter of these European respondents believe that Jews have too much influence in banking and finance. And one-fifth said that Jews have too much influence in politics and the media. So fairly standard sort of anti-Semitic kinds of, of tropes and beliefs. Now to be fair, your, uh, Americans are similarly ignorant about the Holocaust. Uh, in another recent survey, 41% did not know what Auschwitz was. 49% of millennials can't name a single death camp. 31% uh, of Americans believe that fewer than 2 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. Um, and in terms of the, the, the shocking number of never having heard of it, 11% of adults and 22% of millennials in America were unsure if they had heard of the Holocaust. Now, perhaps the good news is at least that 93% of respondents said that, the, that Holocaust education is still important because it could happen again and we don't want it to. So, now back to the CNN survey. Uh, so attitudes sort of leading to action now is, is the question. 40% of respondents said that Jews in their country face the risk of race-related violence. Indeed, the number of reports of anti-Semitic attacks is growing. French police reported that anti-Semitic attacks were up 74% in 2018. Attacks in Germany were up 10% last year, the highest number in a decade. But there are also triple the number of incidents in Germany as there are in France. But it seems likely that the problem is actually far greater than reported. According to another recent poll, 79% of Jews who are harassed or assaulted did not report the crimes to police. So the problem could be four to five times larger than, than what's reported. Now, in the last two decades, 20% of all Jews in France, that is 100,000, have emigrated out of the country. Now, in England, if labor leader Jeremy Corbyn, who's been slow to root out anti-Semitism in his own party, if he becomes prime minister, uh, which is possible with uh, the catastrophe of, of uh, Theresa May and, and Brexit, 40% um, of Jews in the UK would seriously consider leaving the country, according to polls. And overall, more than a third of European Jews have considered emigrating in just in the past five years. Now, some politicians like Corbyn uh, in Britain, Poland, and Hungary have been slow to combat the current wave of anti-Semitism. Perhaps more than outright violence, the overall climate of anti-Semitism could lead to further emigration of the Jewish minority in Europe. This all raises the question of whether Europe still holds to liberal democratic values like freedom of religion. I think the EU's ability to protect Jews on the continent will be an important test of its convictions and will going forward.
Now, the sixth trend, if you, if you believe the headlines, at least, paganism and witchcraft are growing throughout the Western world. It was big news last year that the first temple to the Norse gods was being built in Reykjavik, Iceland. Now, I did discover, by the way, that Denmark beat them to it, building a temple to Odin, you see pictured there on the left, in, uh, in 2016. Um, roughly 4,000 Icelanders now claim to be pagan, though even the, the priest of the new temple there admits the people are not really worshiping or speaking to Odin and Thor. It's more historical reenactment. Um, but in Poland, there has been a recent revival among Slavic native faith believers, also known as pagans, um, although the numbers amount to maybe five to 8,000 uh, members. Uh, in the Scotland census of 2011, roughly 5,500 Scots listed a form of paganism as their religion. In the same census, more than 75,000 Brits identified as pagan, witch, or new age of some sort. Now, it's hard to know what to make of the trend towards, towards paganism. It's generally only a marginal uh, movement in Europe. A population of 500 million, you've got, you know, uh, ten, tens of thousands here and there. But it has potential. Uh, the neo-fascist political party Golden Dawn in Greece, uh, founded in the 1970s and active since then, has actually won dozens of seats in parliamentary elections in the past few years, making it the third largest political party uh, in Greece. And it has a strong pagan uh, streak that it refuses to, uh, refuses to renounce. However, I would say on the whole, while paganism may be seeing a bit of a resurgence thanks to social media, cosplay, uh, and a desire to commune with nature and history, it doesn't seem to pose uh, any particularly serious threat to European society. It does, though, I would say, pose uh, a, a serious threat to the soul of the person who follows it, of course. Well, finally, some good news, right? There is indeed a Christian revival albeit a small one, perhaps, going on in Europe. In 2007, Philip Jenkins published a book on Europe's religious crisis and suggested that Europe could actually see a revival of Christianity. And there are signs that uh, he may have been right. Uh, in Spain, weekly attendance at Mass has increased, as has the number of Spaniards contributing a portion of their taxes to the church. In Germany, the state Lutheran church is seeing growth in new members. And evangelical and Pentecostal churches are seeing solid growth under young leadership. In Norway, although the state uh, evangelical Lutheran church is in decline, the number of Christian congregations in Oslo has doubled in a decade. 5% of Oslo residents attend church weekly now, up from 3%. Uh, the Catholic churches in Oslo have also seen significant growth. Uh, and much of the growth uh, across Norway is due to immigration from Eastern Europe and Africa. Uh, in France, there is anecdotal evidence of increased religiosity among Catholics. Uh, the, church, uh, the Catholic Church was able to mobilize tens of thousands of protesters against a same-sex marriage bill in 2013. In England, it's hard to tell. Um, over 1.2 million people in England and 23 million worldwide have attended the Alpha Course, the evangelization program with a Pentecostal flair um, pioneered in the Church of England in 1977. But the numbers of churchgoers continue to decline, as noted previously. So it's hard to gauge the long-term effects of uh, this program. As the survey data indicated, theological knowledge among Brits is also in disarray. Uh, I would also add, in, in the refugee camps of Europe, where hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees have settled, um, there is a small but important evangelism effort going on. Uh, thousands of refugees have been baptized, many of them citing miraculous visions of Jesus. Uh, it's difficult to say with certainty, however, many, how many converts there are, particularly because of the challenges uh, for Muslims who, who convert. Now, in Eastern Europe, there are a number of signs of revival. Uh, Prime Minister Orban of Hungary generated a new constitution that defines marriage as the union of, union of a man and a woman, seeks the rights of unborn Hungarians, and ties Christianity to Hungarian nationhood. In Croatia, the number of people who believe in God has risen from 39% in 1989 to 72% as of 2004. And in 2014, Croatia amended its constitution to define traditional marriage. It also seems that orthodoxy is growing in Russia, Georgia, and Romania. And in Poland, 
the Alpha in the Catholic context, so a version of the Alpha course, uh, seems to have spurred a charismatic revival in the Catholic Church there. But the idea of uh, an Eastern European revival has its doubters. The Christianity of Hungary is fairly weak, more a show of cultural values than spiritual depth. Only 12% of Hungarians go to church, and only 15% say that religion is important in their daily life. Church attendance in Eastern Europe remains low and falling, despite the fall of communism 30 years ago. So there is a danger that Christianity in Eastern Europe will lose any theological foundation and simply be co-opted by nationalism. This may be true not only in Hungary, but in Ukraine and Russia, where the state and Orthodox Church have long had a close relationship. So as the Pew uh, Research Survey results indicate, large majorities of Europeans no longer regularly attend church or believe in God or nearly any Orthodox theological principle, whereas they do favor abortion and same-sex marriage. There may be small and important revivals of Christianity in various corners of Europe, but the continent does not seem on track for a sweeping return to Orthodox Christianity anytime soon. So, in conclusion, we've looked at, or we looked briefly at least, at seven religious trends, some major, some minor, happening in Europe. The trend of increasing secularism is real. Secularism has left a vacuum at the heart of Europe, but no religion has been strong or persuasive enough to fill it. Islam is on the rise thanks to immigration and high birth rates, but it is not winning huge numbers of converts. Judaism is on the decline in Europe thanks to anti-Semitism at all levels of society. The signs of Christian revival are glimmers at best, false hopes at worst. Political liberalism and church scandals have damaged its witness. So if the goal of Voltaire and his followers is to reduce religious conflict by eradicating the church, they have succeeded in part and failed in part. Secularism has done much to destroy the church in Europe, but it has not quelled religious energy and conflict. In fact, anti-religious sentiment among Christians, Muslims, and Jews is probably a bigger problem than secular bias. So Europe stands at a crossroads, not to be overly dramatic, maybe it's more of a roundabout. Um, like the intersection pictured here called Seven Dials, which is near Covent Garden Market in London, there are several roads that all intersect at that point. So I'm afraid Europe may tear, tear itself apart trying to determine which roads it's going to follow in the future. Thanks. All right, uh, we'll just take a couple of questions now. Uh, anybody have any questions uh, regarding the situation in Europe? So you mentioned um, Orban and Putin and the sort of um, nationalist co-opting of Christianity, um, and you, you know, you regarded it with some like skepticism, like revival? No, probably not. But then um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that because uh, there's been um, I'm with a shooting in New Zealand. Um, what was that? Like two days ago. And, and and more incidents like that, you're seeing sort of a rise of like uh, Christian-y, not Christian, but like co-opted Christian um, nationalist <laughs> memes, like mm -hmm. internet sentiments um, used in as an excuse for violence. And so it seems like the, the Europe, um, the Europe you're describing is ripe for more of that, uh, especially with Christianity being used as sort of just part of this actually nationalist and um, ethnic, you know, like racially driven mm -hmm. um, identity, sort of identity politics. Yeah, so among, uh, among right-wing groups, particularly ones that, that turn to violence, there are kind of two types. There are the neo-pagan types, uh, so, you know, the American Nazi movement, uh, the skinheads in Europe and so on. Uh, I, I didn't track as much with whether this guy from Australia who, who did the shooting in New Zealand um, was using Christian lingo. Last I heard, he was like into sort of crusader memes, like Deus Volt and that kind of stuff. Okay. Well, so there's, yeah, there's the pagan and then kind of the, yeah, call it crusader kind of, you know, yes, we're still at, at war with, with the Muslims years later. Um, the other kind of right-wing groups actually do 
you know, misuse a lot of Christian theology. Um, the groups that were behind, for example, the American Patriot Movement in the 1990s that produced Timothy McVeigh and the Oklahoma City bombing and so on, um, a lot of them, you know, badly misused scripture. Uh, they, or, you know, Dave, David Koresh uh, and his cult and so on are these, these cultish variations of Christianity. Um, a lot of, them, a lot of the, the racist groups in the U.S. get, get that and their, and their hatred of minorities from what's called British Israelitism, which is this older British trend of, hey, well, we're the, you know, we're the, the true children of Israel, uh, and so we should conquer the, the Jews still. So that seems to have migrated over into some of the, uh, some of the American groups. So, yeah, both, both sort of pagan, pagan-ish and Christian-ish groups um, are, yeah, are a big part of, of the right-wing movement. So you mentioned a lot about um, the increase in anti-Semitism and the pretty much decrease in Christianity and um, church attendance and stuff like that. Uh, do you think that in the future it could lead to similar movements as Nazism and um, maybe less extremes of what happened in with Germany? Well, that's a great question. I um I don't think we're likely to end up anywhere near the Holocaust, right? But if you think about the other kinds of policies that had gone into place leading up to the Holocaust, um, Hitler's rise to power, uh, restrictions on free speech, and then restrictions on, on movement of Jews, and then identification, and financial restrictions, and closing businesses, and so on. Um, I, you know, I, I don't want to overdraw that connection, but we're seeing here in the U.S. where judges will try to basically shut down a business if it doesn't follow the right ide- ideological lines and so on. Um, that also seems possible in, uh, in Europe. Um, these decisions by this European Court on Human Rights uh, suggested that, well, any critique of Islam is, is blasphemy, it is un- unacceptable, but all other forms of blasphemy are fine. Um, you can see leading to all kinds of speech codes um, and restrictions, being labeled, well, this is a person who's a hater uh, because, they, uh, because they have you know, certain religious views. Um, I, I, you know, again, not to overdraw it, but I think the ultimate goal of, of secularism and sort of the soft socialism of Europe ultimately is back to animal farm. It really is, you know, leading back to that kind of um, also totalitarian system. That's the only way to ensure that no one speaks out of turn, no one hurts anyone else's feelings, uh, and, and so on. And so I'm afraid that that's long-term, that's the direction that it would go. Again, I don't think that they, I think given Europe's history, I don't think they could ever go back to concentration camps, but they're clearly going to say, well, certain folks are just not welcome here. Um, th- this British education minister has been very clear that, well, if you don't want your kids in, in school, uh, you should move somewhere else. So you mentioned um, the problems of anti-Semitism within the Labour Party, and I was wondering, do you see the anti-Semitism that's emerging again in Europe more of a left-wing or a right-wing problem, or is it something that they're sort of equally sharing? Well, that's a good question. Um, I was surprised that it would come out of Labour because Labour would purport to be the, the liberal, the open, you know, the all in favor of individual rights and, and freedom and so on. Um, but I think that liberals in Europe share with liberals in America now the sense that religion is the cause of our problems. That in Hitler's day, it was that the Jews were the cause of the problem. Now, I think it's more broadly that believers in, at least in Christianity and Judaism, are the problem. Um, So in some ways, I guess it's not a surprise that liberals are anti-liberal in that respect because they believe, again, back to the reference to Voltaire and his children, uh, you know, eradicate the infamous thing, right? Get rid of the church, and then you won't have conflict in Europe anymore. Um, I was just, I was curious, you mentioned the increased, or like the the potential increase of um, Muslims in Europe just by virtue of birth rates, and I'm curious, like, what are the potential forces counteracting that, or is it possible that Islam could simply supplant Europe by virtue of just having more children over time? Mm -hmm. Well, we answer the second part first. I I think according to those Pew uh, projections, even with high Muslim birth rates and so on, 
Muslims will only be maybe 11% of Europe's population in another 30 years from now. So the notion that, you, that Muslims will be a majority, at least you know, numerically a majority, would take you know, another century after that. The question is whether their political power will, will outweigh their, their actual numerical value. And that's where I think the danger of the, the European court is just sort of creating special status for, for Muslim beliefs and, and not critiquing them. Um, the, the replacement rate for a population is something like 2.1 children per family. Uh, and Europe is down below one. The US is below it too, but Europe is below one and a half, and in some places as low as one to 1 1.2. They're simply not having children. It's not just waiting to have children until they're in their 30s, it's just choosing not to have children um, at all. And I, I'm not an expert on this, but my sense is that the Muslim birth rates in places like England, where you know, Muslims from, from Pakistan and other, other places have been coming for, for decades, might have somewhat lower birth rates than, you know, say Saudi or Kuwaiti women or, or Iranian women or something, but they're still very high. I'd say th three and a half to five per family anyway. So something like three to four times the rate of, of Europeans. And I think Weigel's point is, is right, that in the same way that, you know, again, Ocasio-Cortez is right, if you think the world's gonna end in 12 years, why would you have children? Why would you bring them into the world? Um, and I think the, the secular elites they want deeper, you know, deeper European integration, but, but they're not really sure for what. They don't know what the end goal is. Um, if, if they've got a utopian vision of what the EU will look like in the future, they're not having children to populate that future. Right? It's not such a bright future that they all want to have you know, six kids per family so they can all enjoy this, this socialist utopia. Um, they've given up hope that the future has any meaning or any real reason to continue to bring children into it. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question in, in part. Yeah. All right. Uh, we'll actually have a little more time for questions uh, later. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take about a 10-minute break so we can sort of set up. We're going to have a panel discussion. Dr. Stephen Shoemaker is going to bring our two speakers back up. And it's, it's going to be sort of a more informal um, conversation that he's going to have with, uh, with uh, the two of them, uh, Tom and Owen, but also bringing us into it. Sort of this is... That's going to be rounding out our morning. And then after that, uh, they're going to be bringing lunch in. So stick around. So like, about, like I said, about 10 more minutes um, if you need to get some coffee or freshen up or whatever. Thank you. <laughs>